the beginning of the class is with this clip so that the context of the class is appropriately situated and it's self-explanatory once it's seen. So. <coughs> idea of the Eurasia land bridge, um, which Menchikov said would be the cornerstone of the new international order. I just want to read a short selection from Menchikov's speech at this birthday celebration. He said, Lyndon LaRouche, who is present here today, has put forward the conception of building the Eurasian land bridge. The Eurasian land bridge is a program of cooperation with the participation of the USA, Western Europe, Russia, with its scientific potential and enormous mineral resources, China, and India. Cooperation for the purpose of building and reorganizing the economic infrastructure over the next 50 years. This will stimulate the progressive growth of the entire world economy. But this plan can only be implemented if there is a cooperation among all of those countries, if their development pr proceeds in a conflict-free way. Lyndon LaRouche believes that one of the areas of such cooperation needs to be a monetary and financial reform, which he calls a new Bretton Woods. This means to establish a fundamentally new monetary system which in some of its features will recall the old Bretton Woods, the system established at the end of the Second World War, which was subsequently destroyed. Such a new world monetary and financial system, once more, will have to be based on cooperation among all the countries I mentioned. Thus, 2027 may be a year by which the planet has been turned upside down in terms of its economy. At the peak, on top, will be countries that were formerly considered the third world, while the traditionally industrialized countries will find that their place in the international division of labor will be determined by certain highly developed, specialized sectors producing goods and services. My last pronouncement will be this, that Russia's path will be a path that upholds these projects for world cooperation that this, while orienting towards the Eurasian triangle of Russia, China, India, but without forgetting the industrialized countries, Russia should take part in those programs that will lead to conflict-free development that brings about a steady upswing of the world economy. Now, in response to Professor Menchikov's speech, Mr. LaRouche stood up and delivered some remarks at this birthday celebration, um, in which he said the following. He said, the time has come to change some of the axiomatic features of currently ongoing world history. Europe is a collection of failed states west of the Russian and Belarusian border. Therefore, the United States must change its behavior by approaching Russia, China, and India in order to create a new order of relations in the world, bringing all the smaller nations in to cooperate with them. I think we can do it. We can change history. What I think is urgent at this time is a program for action. First of all, intellectual action. There must be more discussion, particularly between leading layers of senior people in Russia and in the United States. We have to establish a sense of the reality of this possibility. In that case, we can probably win over the political process under the heat of crisis to recognize that this is the only alternative to what is presently the most dangerous situation in all modern history. So I think that you can see that what both Professor Menchikoff and Linda LaRouche said at that time, almost eight years ago, is very prescient of precisely where the world finds itself now. 
uh, as we're working to bring the United States into the BRICS and to stop the immediate threat of World War III. It was also during this same event that Russian academician, uh, who was then the head of the Council for the Study of Productive Forces, Alexander Gronberg, who also passed away recently in 2010, proposed that the Bering Strait Tunnel connection, which you have a picture of on your screen, um, which is the keystone project of this entire world Eurasian land bridge, which uh, Menshikov was referring to, proposed that this Bering Strait connection be completed by the year 2027, which would have been Professor Menshikov's 100th birthday, and that the city on the Russian side of the tunnel be named after Stanislav Menshikov, to which Menshikov's wife leaped up and responded, and on the American side, there will be a city named after Lyndon LaRouche. So, not only does this project, the Bering Strait Tunnel Project, symbolize the necessary strategic friendship between these two great nations, Russia and the United States, but I think it also symbolizes a close personal friendship between two great men, the late Stanislav Menshikov and Lyndon LaRouche. In conclusion, I want to just read an excerpt from birthday greetings that Professor Menshikov sent to Lyndon LaRouche for LaRouche's 90th birthday, which occurred in 2012, which were included in a collection of such greetings uh, that came in from all around the world. And I think this is a very proper conclusion for tonight's broadcast. And this is what he had to say. I am happy to be able to congratulate Lyndon LaRouche on his 90th birthday. He is a rare case of human activity, his being so active. Lyndon is an example of a creative mind that never stops emanating original ideas. And quite frankly, I am full of envy that at 90 years, he can do all that he is doing. This is, of course, a result of God's good will. I cannot put it differently, because usually such brilliant minds are not blessed with the kind of stamina and health that have helped Lyndon to continue his activity at this age. I believe this shows that God not only gives him this possibility, but that God also approves of the way Lyndon has been acting all these years. Otherwise, it would not happen. So my first thought was that I envy Lyndon in a good way. My health is not as good, and he gives me an example that I try to follow. I hope that he will go on in this way for years to come, contributing to human scientific knowledge. LaRouche is the author of theoretical discoveries in the area I work in, which is the world economy. It doesn't mean that we share the same view of everything, and we have been arguing as many times as, as we have met over the years. But that also does not mean that we are adversaries, for we both know that we are thinking in the same way and in the same direction. I wish Lyndon good health for many years and a happy family life with Helga, his wonderful companion. Mm -hmm. Professor Stanislav Menshikov, August 28th, 2012. So with that said, I would like to bring a conclusion to our broadcast here tonight. I would like to thank both Dennis Small and Megan Beats for joining. The uh, conception that we intend in the presentation, uh, which is in part an extension of what we did last week, is one in which uh, what is divested from the mind, like we tried to do last week in part of the beginning of our presentation, we divest from the mind is the notion that the purpose of such gatherings as this is to somehow give information about what might be a policy that we might wish to advocate, that we might wish you to agree to, that we might wish to then implement. This is not what we are doing. This meeting is a meeting occurring in the midst of a policy being
being implemented that we devised, that we organized, and that we did together with the most powerful forces in the world. It was done during the period of the 1990s, it was begun. It was matured, it was amplified, it has now become the direction of the world. It is not being fought for to become the direction of the world. Now this is crucial because without that as the premise for what we're going to talk about, the class itself would be useless um, and your participation would be useless uh, because you would be participating in something that wouldn't be actually happening, wouldn't be occurring. You would be participating in a delusion. You would suffer the same unfortunate and unintended fate as that being presently undergone by the thousands and tens of thousands of people demonstrating every night in New York City. That would be your fate. But because you're at this meeting, and because of the way we are presenting what we're presenting, you are not suffering that fate. The people who are in the street are correctly in the street. But they are unaware of why they're in the street. They believe they know. But they do not. They must be in the street because there is a central problem to be confronted. And that problem is of a certain form which they refer to as what they call racism. It is, but is not the racism they think. There are a group of people largely centered around London, the city of London, and Wall Street that do not have a human conception of human beings. These people are racists. They are opposed to the human race. They are opposed to the identity of the human race. They are opposed to the substance of the actions of the human race and they see themselves as the caretakers or the game wardens of the human race. They see the rest of what they would refer to as the non-human race as a zoo. And they believe in placing people in zoos, which was done in the case of the Bronx Zoo when it was first opened up when a Congolese by the name of Odhabenga was placed in the zoo as an exhibit and as part of the exhibit, as part of the animal exhibits. It's well known, you can go look it up. It's a book called Odhabenga, hmm? The Tale of One Man's uh, 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 Destruction or something like that in America, written by Phillips Werner Bradford. You can look it up. So, and that was done by the people that ran the Museum of Natural History which included on its board, or rather in its, in its affiliate board, people like J.P. Morgan, um, the more important people like Madison Grants and some of these other characters, William Hornaday, names that don't maybe, maybe mean anything to you, but they should. Because if the names meant something to you, New York City would be a completely different place. It's important to know that in the view of these people, um, who are no longer the dominant political force in the world. But in the view of these people, the shrinkage of New York City, the destruction of New York City, which was begun during the period of the 1960s and 70s, was a civic duty. It was a reform. It was a form of creating a civilized New York, free of the encumbrance of the poor and the genetically unfit. That was their notion of what they were doing. Various regimes have been recruited at different points to try to implement that design. It was against that design that this organization was both founded and deployed from the time of 1966 to 1975. We referenced that 
Uh, Lyndon LaRouche founded this organization by was giving classes at the New School back in 1966 and then gave some other classes. But then during the period of the Columbia strike, Columbia University, that's where uh, the organization, the National Caucus of SDS Labor Committees was formed uh, in the period of the spring of 1968, starting actually in the fall of 67 and then extending into the spring. Now, Hamilton's New York and Hamilton's America are the America that is being addressed by the premier of China, the president of Russia, the prime minister of India, and people like Christina Kirshner of Argentina and others. That's the United States that they are addressing. And Lyndon LaRouche and his movement is the only self-conscious embodiment of that United States available, which is why that movement back in the 1990s, actually at the time that Lyndon LaRouche was in jail and the World Berlin Wall came down, he wrote from, Bert, from jail the proposal that later became the proposal that has now been adopted. Yes, with additions, yes, with ex expansion, and yes, with a lot of contributions from a lot of people from around the world, no question about that. So we're not saying that we invented everything that the Chinese are thinking, or we invented everything the Russians are thinking. No, no, there were things in those cultures that resonated with that proposal. But the main thing that resonated with that proposal was the anti-colonial history of the United States, the true United States which fought against the British Empire and whose allies were the Russians in the case of Catherine the Great, the Chinese in the case of Sun Yat-sen, and the nation of India just in the case of not so much Mahatma Gandhi and all that, but the people who were being killed by the millions, approximately 10 million of them, during the American Revolution when they were starved to death. There were about that many million Indians, approximately over a 20 year period really. But during the period of the American Revolution, that's exactly what that was going on. The looting by the British of India, which had first destroyed their textile industries, then made them import textiles from London, made them grow opium, used the opium against the Chinese, and the whole was on the backs of black slavery, which England never actually abolished, contrary to popular belief about that. That is the history that some know, because they bothered to read, they bothered to study it, they probably actually tried to get to know it. So this is the movement which you are in, and you've been brought into, and LaRouche, from the very beginning, in using a particular conception, changed the world in, in the very first things that he was writing and he was uh, uh, distributing uh, on the streets of places like New York City. Uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time here because we're trying to get, get one conception. It's one conception we intend, you've already heard it in part. And because we've, we've demonstrated it, it's wrong to blather about it. But this idea that LaRouche talks about, about what's called potential relative population density, let me give you a way of thinking about it. Uh, and, and this will be a better way to approach that idea <clears throat> in terms of your actual recent historical experience. In 1966, the seat of American manufacturing was not Detroit, it was New York City. There were one million blue collar workers and services related to blue collar in New York City. It's the largest manufacturing center in the country. Now, there was something very important about Detroit. And if you go back and bother to uh, look up Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech of August 28th, 1963, you will see that that speech was delivered two months earlier in June at Cobalt Hall in Detroit. 
to a rally that was largely comprised of UAW workers and people from Reverend, Reverend Franklin's church, Aretha Franklin's father, who was one of the major forces for civil rights and had been responsible for integrating the UAW during the 1950s and 60s. The speech had over 10,000 people at it. Some people say there were 25,000 people. I don't know if that's an exaggeration. Done at Cobo Hall. And the entire last part of the speech that everybody today quotes was all given right there at that time. Now, there's a reason for this. The March on Washington was called the March for Jobs and Freedom. The city of Detroit, at the time of that march, had the highest living standard of any city in the United States. Let me repeat that. The living standard in the city of Detroit, not the highest working class standard, the highest standard of any major city in the United States. Sure, of course, there were places that were smaller, you know, Beverly Hills or something, I suppose, if you want to call that a living standard. But that's not really a city. <laughs> that's not a city. So what was happening here was, when King was talking about civil rights, the conception was completely different than the one that you today have thanks to British liberalism, which has changed your entire conception of what this was. This wasn't about the idea of sitting next to somebody at a lunch counter or something like that. I mean, that was all part of something. That was demonstrative. But it was recognized that unless there was economic progress, unless that was the centerpiece of it, there was no real political progress. And King knew that, and that's where the troops came from for the first civil rights march. The notion that civil rights was a black movement is one of the most laughable notions if you just know the history. This was Martin Luther King taking the American Constitution and realizing the implications of it in practice, extending it to the south of the United States because it was the easiest place to see the contradiction. But it was true all over the United States. I mean, the incidents that we're talking about that we're seeing now today on the streets of America were going on in right down in Midtown Manhattan at, at the uh, Birdland, 52nd Street, where Miles Davis was beaten up by a, by a white cop because he was standing outside smoking a cigarette of the club he was playing in. And the cop, the cop came up and said, move along. And he said, what for? I, I'm, I'm playing here. That's my name up there. I'm Miles Davis. The cop said, move along. Miles said, I'm not going anywhere. And he got clubbed, about 200 people saw it, and it started almost a near riot. That was August 25th of 1959. 30 years later, Miles was still talking about it. And it always, you could hear it in his music throughout the entire time. So I'm just saying that those kinds of incidents were going on you know, in New York City. It wasn't really different, it was just up south. As some of us used to call them. Yeah. Huh? But I mentioned this not be because it's useful to understand people like Hamilton and others had already addressed these matters. And they understood that they were addressing these matters. It was all very conscious. I'll just read you briefly uh, from Hamilton's letter to John Lawrence. I think I've once before referred to this. Um, uh, Sorry, to John Jay, actually I think it's to, uh, where well, John Lawrence, his friend, was on a mission. Uh, Lawrence was the son of Henry Lawrence, who was the first head of the uh, Continental Congress. Uh, and if I can't find it very quickly here, I'll just, uh, oh here it is, enlisting slaves as, as soldiers. That's what I was looking for. Dear sir, this is written to John Jay by Alex, from Alexander Hamilton. And it is written in 1779. So that means Hamilton is 22 years old when he writes this. Colonel Lawrence, who will have the honor of delivering you this letter, is on his way to South Carolina on a project, which I think in the present situation of affairs there is a very good one and deserves every kind of support and encouragement. This is to raise two, or th two three, or four battalions of Negroes with the assistance of the government of that state by contributions from the owners in proportion to the number they possess. 
If you should think proper to enter upon the subject with him, he will give you a detail of his plan. He wishes to have it recommended by Congress to the state. And as an inducement, they would engage to take those battalions into continental pay. Right? Goes on and describes the, the whole thing. Now, of course, when Lawrence got there, this didn't work. Because the Southerners said, quote, we would rather be subjugated by England than release our slaves. 1779. Now, what's relevant, though, is to understand that from Hamilton's standpoint, the thing he was about to build, which comes very near after this, is built in the spirit of the actual content of the American Revolution. The actual content of the American Revolution was recognized by many. And where the revolution was going to go was recognized by many. I reference this not because I'm trying to somehow be politically relevant to what's going on in the streets of New York City. I'm trying to tell you something about Alexander Hamilton and the actual United States of which you are a part and which we are presently attempting to deploy. Hamilton wrote in 1781, this is two years later, a set of papers. And the papers were called the Continentalist. Now, let me explain something. You know, there were 13 colonies who had just become United States, but Hamilton was already thinking about the unity of the continent as a whole. Yes, it began with the unity of the 13 states. But when he was writing this, he wanted to make his countrymen aware of something that they really just had to understand very, very clearly. And I'll just read you the first paragraph from Continentalist Number 1 and then get to the point I want to make, which is a little bit later. So Hamilton is at this point, uh, I think he's still 23 years old, he may have just turned 24. He says, it would be the extreme of vanity in us not to be sensible that we began this revolution with very vague and confined notions of the practical business of government. To the greater part of us, it was a novelty. Of those who under the former constitution had had opportunities of acquiring experience, a large proportion adhere to the opposite side, that is, they went to the British side. And the remainder can only be supposed to have possessed ideas adapted to the narrow colonial sphere in which they had been accustomed to move. So what this is all about, this, these essays are about is, look, the best of us have thought about colonies. Well, and, and, and others of us who might have been uh, uh, qualified only were ruling for the British. And they've now turned to the other side. So how are we going to actually rule ourselves. So he goes on and he says, no friend to order or to rational liberty can read without pain and disgust the history of the commonwealths of Greece. Generally speaking, they were a constant scene of the alternate tyranny of one part of the people over the other, or of a few usurping demagogues over the whole. Most of them had been originally governed by kings, da da da. He goes on and describes it. And he says later, in a comparison of our governments which those, with those of the ancient republics, we must without hesitation give the preference to our own. Because every power with us is exercised by representation, not in uh, uh, tumultuary, tumult filled assemblies of the collective body of the people where the art of impudence of the orator or the tribune rather than the utility of justice or the, of the measure could seldom fail to govern. He's saying that we're not governed by just having mobs of people get together and whoever can talk best, then that person actually ends up carrying the day, whereas the actual importance of something that's just should. We have representative government. This is extraordinary, it's very important for you. Because we're not talking about, and Hamilton was very, very, very much against the evils of confederacy. He talked about this greatly in Continentalist number three. He said, if the federal government should lose its authority, it would certainly follow that we will see a dissolving of our revolution. Political societies in close neighborhood must either be strongly united under one government or there will infallibly exist emulations and quarrels. This is in human nature. He goes on and talks about this. He says, 
though it will ever be their true interest to preserve the Union, 1781, their vanity and self-importance will be very likely to overpower that motive and make them cease to place themselves at the head of particular confederacies independent of the general one. 1781. Now, this is before, of course, therefore, the Constitutional Convention, all of that. Finally, what I want to refer to here from uh, Continentalist number four is the issue of credit. Because he raises it here, and this is now before he's formulated a national bank. This is, this is going to be uh, 10 years before he will write his report on a national bank. Uh, he says, the great defect of the Confederation, which is what they had at that moment, is that it gives the United States no property, or in other words, no revenue, nor the means of acquiring it inherent in themselves, and independent, on the te on the temp and in and and independent on the of the temporary pleasure of the different members. And power without revenue in, in political society is a name. While Congress continue altogether dependent on the occasional grants of several states for the means of defraying the expenses of the federal government, it can neither have dignity, vigor, nor credit. Credit supposes specific and permanent funds for the punctual payment of interest with the moral certainty of a final redemption of the principal. In our situation, it would probably require more on account of the general dividends. He's talking about because they're all in the middle of the war. This is during the revolution. This is being written before Yorktown. So we haven't even won the, be the battle with the British yet. And he's got a plan in which his conception is not nearly, as we've said before, well, all these places have different war debts, and we've got to combine the debt. And for that, we need a singular government which can pay that debt because otherwise some powers, some individual colonies, will be at a disadvantage than others. Some of the larger ones particularly may have paid a lot more out in debt than the smaller ones, but everybody benefited equally. Yeah, okay, but that's a very pragmatic, and it's true that Hamilton did use that during the period of the Continental Con uh, the, 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 the calling of the Constitutional Convention. But that wasn't his idea. The conception was a singular, continental-wide power called the United States. Yes, it was primarily a vision at that point. But of course, that's precisely how the country was brought into being, by that vision. This is not to say that Hamilton is the sole originator of these ideas. Uh, and I especially don't want to, uh, to denigrate or in any way uh, uh, leave out Ben Franklin's role, which is the central role, both as a mentor to Hamilton also because of his central role in Philadelphia, and as a scientist, most importantly. Uh, Hamilton, because of his scientific capabilities, had inherited the work of the network of the great scientist Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, who had died in 1716. Hamilton was, uh, Franklin was born in 1706. And during the period of particularly the 1740s, uh, and even somewhat earlier, Franklin was uh, making recontact with the networks uh, in science that, that Leibniz had originally been in touch with. Um, but not to go far afield from here, what I want to make, mainly say here is that Franklin, at the age of 23, had been writing about the necessity of paper currency, and he based the idea, as he said, for the reason that credit would be viable on the fact that not only were the colonies of the soon-to-be-called United States rich, not only was the land good, but the population would grow. And it was in the growth of the population that the wealth of the country was contained. This is the core idea. This is the central idea. And that is the idea that people suspect is the issue in the streets of Brooklyn, in the streets of Staten Island, in the streets of Ferguson. People suspect that that is the idea. And they're right. What is the value of a human being? That is the issue. How do you value a human being? Well, in the case of Hamilton, in the case of Franklin, in the case of LaRouche, we are saying that all wealth all wealth, all physical wealth 
comes from human beings. It does not come from land. It does not come from the soil. It is not contained in gold or silver. It's not contained in property titles, including human property titles, which most of you are presently held under, as were my ancestors. You are held under that right now today. Wealth does not come from these things. It comes from the creativity of the human mind deployed in the realm of discoveries and inventions that transform nature as human beings are able to comprehend and address that nature. Because you don't know anything about nature that you don't know through the prism of being a human being. You've never experienced nature and never will. You can never have any direct contact with nature because you're dealing with nature through a sensory apparatus which lies to you. And you're always correcting for it by trying to extend the sensory apparatus in various ways through what are called techniques or technology. You extend your sense of vision through orbiters that go to Mars. You extend your sense of hearing through amplifiers and radios and things like that. Hmm? You can't fly, but a plane can. That's what you do. You are limited, severely limited, when it comes to the question of your physical capabilities. You are not bound by your physical capabilities. You are bound by your inability to change your axioms and nothing else. If you can change your axioms, if you can change your conceptions about the world, the world will smile. And the when it smiles, it complies with what you did. That's the difference between getting blown up in a laboratory and not. <laughs> if you have found some principle out which is in coordination with nature, right, for, for here's with nature, and you mix certain chemicals, you will be here at the end of that. But if, on the other hand, you have either failed to pay attention or failed to be correct, you will not. We call this human error, but you would also call it human success. It's not natural success. You can never encounter nature. You can only encounter a human conception or a humanized nature. So all wealth, which is wealth, which is itself a human conception, comes from human beings. So the value of every human being is as great as the creativity of the society and the individual in conjunction with that society can provide. So this is why we consider, those of us from this faction, that there is a cost of production but there is a cost of consumption, and that is not seen by us as being a debt. What do I mean? Well, everybody knows that plant and equipment uh, and, 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 and land and, and maintaining land, those are costs of production. But then when it gets to this question of wages, as it's called, there's this big dispute. Lower wages mean that there, there's a higher rate of profit, it's said. That's a lie. Higher wages mean that there is a higher rate of profit. Because the conception is that the more productive a human being can be by enhancing their powers of creation, then the greater their productivity will, in fact, uh, manifest itself as being. That's, that's, that's like, now, that isn't the notion that oligarchies have. They don't see things that way. They don't believe that. But the idea that that is what rules the world today that is an illusion. That is your illusion, if you have it, if you don't have it. That is the pleasant illusion of cowardly Americans that refuse to recognize that other people around the world have stepped up and have stepped ahead. And the reason for that 
is the cowardly Americans' seduction by Yago-like racists, anti-human racists, who have seduced the Americans, Othello-like, to believe in their supreme idiotic arrogance that they are still on top. You know, you just hide. You're not on top. <laughs> so this is the issue. Now, how did this happen? That's what we're going to take a little time on. See, how did you get bamboozled, hoodwinked, baffled, huh? deluded, confused, dazed? How did it happen? With your cooperation, for one thing, but we won't, we won't dwell on that. So that's what we're going to do. So now last week, I told you guys something about Robert Moses. We, we, we're doing this now. I mean, please, I'll get to this. Because you know, we, as some people should know, are famous, infamous, for our attacks on the bridge. We're always talking about the bridge. Huh? People say, well, why do you do that? That's some sort of esoteric thing. We understand these people once were really important. And uh, I guess they still bother you. Um, and we can understand that you might be upset, but what are you saying? It sounds like us really, you know what you're doing? You're really trying to take the blame off various of these crackers in America that are doing this and that to all of us black people or all of us X or all of us Y. That, that's what people basically, but when you get right down, that's what people sort of say to us. We understand you're saying that, but this is some kind of weird obsession or tick, some kind of hysterical tick you got. <laughs> Some turret syndrome kind of politi political turret syndrome. And, and you're talking about this all the time, and we don't get it. Okay, so last week we began introducing some of you to Robert Moses. Now, why is this important? Well, because the entirety of New York City, including the decaying New York City, was um, given cosmetic so surgery. Well, actually, I wouldn't call it cosmetic surgery uh, by this character. Most of the highways built, most of the monstrosities that you see around this place, this guy built. Um, and it was a, a book written about him a long time ago now, 40 years ago, called The Power Broker. Because he was the most powerful person in New York City, and he never held elective office. And, and uh, I don't believe he did, actually. But, 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 but uh, well, he was in like commissions and things like that. But the important element here to say is that I'm going to play you the last portion of what some of you heard last week. It will go then into a discussion about what he did. So let me tell you exactly what, why he's important to you. There's a term that gets used all the time, too, that may confuse you, especially if you hear them in New York City. They're called reform and progressive. <laughs> These two terms, when they're used, you may think, that these are people that are looking out for your interests. No, it's not what it is. And you're going to hear six minutes here read to you about Robert Moses. And it will tell you what this is. And then I'm going to do just something to pick up a bit on that, tell you about a, little bit, a few things that happened to us here in New York City and to you. Uh, as a result of the work of people like Robert Moses and his protégés. <coughs> so, some of you heard this first part, which uh, I can't resist playing again, because it was so good. And uh, also because Bruce wasn't here last week, and he needs to hear this. It's always helpful. Uh, yeah, speaker might be good. Uh, this is pretty good, but I think it'll be better with that. Moses came more and more to admire that system. Such admiration, of course, postulated as a concomitant an amiable contempt for the capability for government found in members of the lower classes, which in this context included everyone not a member of the British nobility. And from this attitude, it was a logical step to reserve supreme contempt for those whom the British aristocracy considered most incapable of self-rule the people of the nations British troops had conquered, 
which meant in general people of color, brown, yellow, or black. Moses took this step. With agitation for increased self-government rising in Great Britain's colonies, Oxford in 1911 sponsored a World Congress on Race Problems to examine the question, along with the broader question of general discrimination by Great Britain against colored people. Delegations were sent by the colonies and by liberal organizations from many European countries. American students selected Moses to represent their country because of his reputation as a debater. Previous speakers had pleaded for equality, for fraternity, for immediate brotherhood. Moses' point of view was somewhat different. Immediate brotherhood, he said flatly, was not practical. The subject peoples of the British Empire were simply not ready for self-government yet. Furthermore, he didn't see any time in the near future when they would be. As the audience realized what they were hearing, a certain restiveness began to develop. When Moses started explaining, quite clearly, why he didn't think the subject peoples would be ready for self-government for a long time, several subject people rose and charged at him. One step ahead of them was roommate Higgins. He grabbed Moses, shoved him through a door at the back of the speaker's platform, and hustled him out of the building. The climax of Moses' academic career was the thesis he submitted for a PhD degree, the civil service of Great Britain. The thesis contained no torch divine or head. The floridness of Moses' Yale poetry and prose style had turned hard, cogent, and marvelously lucid at Oxford. Short, hard sentences must have carried his professors through the intricacies of parliamentary infighting and regulation rewriting with refreshing ease. He displayed not only a complete familiarity with a bewildering array of bureaucratic technicalities, but a gift for the felicitous phrase. Describing Carlyle's appeal to Parliament to muck out the Aegean stables of bureaucracy, Moses wrote that Carlyle appealed with excremental eloquence. Macaulay's speech on the need for promotion by merit was, he said, the most masterly vindication of the principles of competition ever left unanswered. Not only Moses' prose style, but what was behind the style had hardened too. The all-too-conscious revelation in the thesis's pages of what the British civil service symbolized to Robert Moses demonstrated that two years of Oxford had solidified the cast of mind formed in the mold of heredity and upbringing. The youth who had been raised in an atmosphere pervaded by a mixture of idealism and arrogance had found the rationale for such noblesse oblige in the British theory of the rights and duties of the upper classes. The thesis with which he laid the capstone of his education focused down on the British civil service as the embodiment of this attitude, the practical result of this theory, and he saw the result as glorious. The thesis reveals its author as a man convinced that public service is a noble calling and one that must be based on the highest ideals. Moses did not believe that the perfection of the British civil service system was an end in itself. Rather, he saw it as an instrument, an indispensable one, for the implementation of great social reforms. Progressive nations, he wrote, had begun creating new departments of government to free mankind from the traditional horrors of old age, disease, and unemployment. These new departments, he said, must have leaders and a personnel with outstanding qualifications if they are to fulfill their noble purpose. His idealism is further documented by his admiration, an admiration that approached idolatry, for the uncompromising reformers, Trevelyan, Northcote, the genius Macaulay, who had fought to make the civil service system equal to the new demands, and by the vehemence, the sincere, deep passion of the phrases with which he described the patronage system that had been the reformer's chief obstacle. Quoting descriptions of the incompetence whom patronage foisted upon the service, he cited a report which concluded, patronage is the worst form of bribery, and concurred with feeling. The incessant demands of office seekers and the contemptible meanness and petty irritations attendant on the distribution of favors are, he said, intolerable. Merit, 
Open competition, Moses said again and again, should be the sole basis of appointment and promotion in public life. Mingled with the idealism, of course, was the arrogance. It was subordinate to the idealism. If the idealism was displayed in Moses' convictions about what should be done, the arrogance emerged only in his convictions as to who was best suited to do it. But it was every bit as pure and uncompromising. The civil service of Great Britain reveals its author as the possessor of a depth of class feeling and conservatism more appropriate to a retired colonel of the guards than a young progressive from New York City. Open competition may be what the young author said he wanted, but the openness was to certain individuals only. Merit may be the determinant he said he desired, but it was not merit based on a man's handling of his job. The competition Moses wanted was a competition open only to a highly educated upper class. The merit he was talking about was merit not in public service, but in the education given exclusively to members of that class. What Moses admired in the British civil service was that it had two separate and distinct classes, a very small administrative and policy-making upper division reserved for university men, and a much larger lower division consisting of clerks of ordinary education selected through examinations on the high school level who do the lower and more mechanical work. That's not, that's not. Okay, now, so that is who he, what he were talking about. Now the British Civil Service is the essay or the PhD thesis, but it is the template which he then used when he came into New York and began to build various things in New York. He was, his idea of an exemplary person, exemplary leader, as in terms of a political leader for America, was Woodrow Wilson. Uh, remember, it's Wilson, Wilson that refounds the Klan from the White House a year later. Now, you heard a mention there of some reformers that he said that he modeled himself on. Uh, and these were British reformers. Uh, and uh, two of them were Trevelyan and Northcote. So I want you to know who, who Sir Charles Edward Trevelyan was. Uh, it's just a quote from something. Trevelyan's most enduring mark on history may be the quasi-genocidal and anti-Irish racial sentiment he expressed during his term in the critical positioning of administering relief for the millions of Irish peasants suffering under the Irish famine as Assistant Secretary to H.M. Uh, Treasury, Her Majesty's Treasury, Treasury uh, in 1840-1859 under the Whig administration of Lord Russell. Does anybody want to unpack that for me? Charles Trevelyan was the person that was responsible for the execution of millions of Irish whose food was being exported from Ireland as they were dying in the potato famine. That's who he is, okay? Uh, now, the BBC's Historic Figures webpage, however, says, quote, his most lasting contribution, however, began in the 1850s with the publication of his and Sir Stafford Northcote's report, The Organization of the Permanent Civil Service. So what we're talking about is that Moses writes a thesis on the British Civil Service. But he's taking it from this work by Northcote and Trevelyan. And now, there's a couple of other things just to say, just to be very clear about uh, this. Um, he described, Trevelyan described the Irish famine as, quote, an effective mechanism for reducing surplus population, as well as the judgment of God. <laughs> Now we begin to come home, for those of you that are sleeping, as you're being told about your appropriate targets for racism. I'm not bot blaming, you're so hot in here, I realize that. But I just want people to understand something. You know, Lyndon LaRouche, from, uh, I guess I met him in December of 1970. Uh, he was writing, I, I read a, a document that he wrote at the time on education. And he was complaining, he was making the point about what had happened at CUNY, City University of New York, CCNY also, but City University of New York. 
Because what they were doing was they were using the demand by the black nationalists for open admissions to destroy the entire CUNY educational process, which would ultimately go from being free huh, to a whole lot of money. Now, now that's what, now, so now it appeared, it appeared to those who were wishing to be uninformed that the incorporation of various of these various black studies programs into the system was opening the system up. It wasn't that the black studies issue was the issue. No, the issue was breaking the system. It's like recruiting blacks from Mississippi to go up to Detroit to break the strikes. And then you put the blacks in a town called Inkster. And you have the whites in a town called Dearborn. And you run this operation between the two places, which, which is the thing that uh, was going on back then. And before its people were doing that at that time, and others were doing that. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with the black studies programs of the 69 period, 69 to 70 period, vis-a-vis -vis the New York City. Because why? Because what they was actually happening, and the person doing it, I will name in a moment, was what they were really doing was that they needed to destroy the constituency building and organizing that still existed at that time of the Democratic Party. And they were trying to destroy the neighborhoods that this was based on. It's coming after Lindsay had come in in 1964. And the notion was to pass poverty money around the city, weakening the structure of the Democratic Party and the Democratic clubhouse structure, and at the same time not replacing it with anything just creating what we used to refer to as the poverty pit structure. Hmm? So Lynn was saying that. That's what you just put out. At Al Sharpton, of course, is sort of the Richard the Third sort of <laughs> distillation of everything evil of that whole sort of, and that's what you get, right? Because Sharpton really has no base, right? Where's his church? As Spike Lee used to say, where's this guy's church? Hmm? Right, in that one. But he doesn't need one because he is the, he's sort of the sinosure of this. He's sort of the, 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 the distillation of this process that they were doing in the 60s. And LaRouche had his people, the Labor Committee, intervene on behalf of the New York City's Teachers Union at that time, back in 68, against this, saying, listen, we need a complete overhaul of the educational programs and, 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 and curricula, yes. And yes, there are merits to what's being said about what's not being taught. But the issue here is that there has to be a unity between the teachers and the community for that purpose, not the creation of these community control boards. Now, the person who did that was Mac George Bundy. The same Mac George Bundy who, and when he became, he, he had been the head of the National Security Agency, National Security Advisor, excuse me, to, to President Kennedy. Um, and had left that position and taken over the Ford Foundation. And from the Ford Foundation had begun a process uh, that would create what were called at the time, we referred to them as strategic hamlets in the cities of the United States. It's hard to, shall we say, give you all this sort of sense of what the, you, if, if you want to have a sense of social unrest, you had to be there at that time. Because what we have nothing is a pick, what we have now is nothing compared to what we had then. Absolutely nothing compared to what we had then. What's relevant, however, is that what Mac George Bundy was doing was on behalf of the establishment, he was trying to destroy the basis of what Dr. King had been trying to do, spe specifically, by promoting what he, what was called the Black Power Movement. What he gave a speech about this in 1966 when he assumed the head, becoming the chairman of the, uh, of the Ford Foundation and said in his speech that he didn't know exactly what black power was, but they were going to be supporting it. <laughs> now it's important to understand because this is the America in which a year earlier King has just won the voting through uh, actions of various people, the Voting Rights Act. And what's happening is that now the issue of economic justice is right there on the table. The key idea is now disrupt this, destroy it. And what reformers do is they do exactly what it sounds like. They reshape, they reform, they restructure hmm? in order to create the dominance of this upper class over 
the administering of, well, whatever it may be that they wish to see. Now, in the case of New York City, to come up a bit, we had a character by the name of Roger Starr. Some of you would know his name, some, many of you don't know his name. He wrote something in 1976, it was an editorial in the New York Times, calling for what he called the planned shrinkage of New York. Um, it's important to know what this referred to because it <coughs> referred to something that uh, later, Patrick, well, earlier actually, Patrick Moynihan had stated about treating the ghettos with benign neglect. Yeah, yeah. The reason I bring up Roger Starr, I'll just read you something from his obituary. I bring him up at this point is the following. This is just one paragraph. <coughs> um, Although Mr. Starr's beliefs were passionate, they were always a work in progress. From his Trotskyite campus days, he evolved into a new dealer dedicated to slum clearance, public housing, and urban renewal in the Robert Moses mold. But he eventually became disillusioned by what he viewed as the flawed execution of good intentions. He adopted a neoconservative viewpoint extolling the free market in a tough love code of social morality and individual responsibility. Now, we don't have time to unpack this narrative, so to speak. That's a slang term, so let me now clean up my language. The neocons were mostly Trotskyists. When we talk about people like William Crystal, or we talk about the people that did the Iraq wars, when we talk about the Cheney administration, these were people who were Trotskyists, in other words, socialists of the, in the 1930s, shifted over during the period of the Hitler-Stalin Pact, or at the time of the Second World War, and then became the people that, well, there are many different one, of, of them, uh, which we won't go through and try to name here, but what you have in the Obama administration and what Obama is, is this. And that is the significance of Victoria Nuland. Because when Kagan, her husband, but Victoria Nuland uh, right, is, was the deputy advisor to Cheney. Mm -hmm. Kagan, her husband, is the, one of the founders of the Project for a New American Century. I mean, that is the hardest of the hardcore of Cheney's people. And when Obama was telling people in 2012, I think in the State of the Union, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, that to read Kagan's article, or he referred to it, I think, in the State of the Union, one of the addresses he gave, you have to realize that Obama knew exactly what he was doing because he is these people. One has to understand the mentality. The conception here is reform and progressive doesn't mean to these people what it means to you, what you think you it would mean. Franklin Roosevelt used that against them. That's why they called him a traitor to his class, because they assumed that FDR was the same thing as they were, because FDR, after all, was a Democrat, and the Democratic Party had been the prop party of slavery and treason forever. We all clear about that, that in other words, that everybody, that the Dixiecrats, as they were called, everybody in the South was a Democrat, all those racists with their racist plantations and so on, and that the August Belmont, who had headed up the party here hmm, during the period of the 1870s and so on and so forth, coming after Martin Van Buren, this was all Democratic Party. Well, they, they may refuse to, but the fact is that's what it was. It was Roosevelt who changed that Democratic Party by, by recruiting Abraham Lincoln to the party. Posthumously, of course, but he, that's what he did. And went through his New Deal. And that was the way it went. That's why everybody black, virtually in the country, went from being a Republican to being Democratic. They weren't Democratic. They were voting for Roosevelt. They were Rooseveltians. And Roosevelt won you know, four elections, 32, 36, 40, and 44. So therefore, they were voting for Roosevelt that whole time. Later, they were convinced, or they were sort of convinced in the course of things, that they were Democrats. No, the Democrats were always the party of slavery, racism, and treason. 
And the Obama presidency is completely coherent with that. It's utterly, it's, it's, it's in complete lockstep with the character and nature of this phenomenon. Now, Lyndon LaRouche, however, makes the point continually that the Republican Party of today is, if anything, more criminal. And, and this now brings us sort of to the conclusion of this part of what I want to say. Because I want you to understand what it is we're doing with the project of the BRICS. What is the BRICS project and what was it that Hamilton saw when he saw the American continent? And John Quincy Adams, what did he see? Of course, he was the son of John Adams, and so he knew Hamilton and these guys. Huh? He was a young, very young, but he was in the fight. He was already a secret agent by the time he was 10 years old. He had learned French on the boat going over, and you know they used him in all kinds of peculiar capacities in, in France, and then, of course, later, later in Russia. He was a linguist. He, but he was in the fight from the time he was a very, very young man. These people saw the idea that what you could do is you could use the creativity of the human mind and the technological progress that could be achieved by applying that creativity. And you could create an economy which was independent of moneyed interests. But it wasn't only going to just be a, a, a nation, a government-based, government-centered economy. You wanted to have internal improvements in the country that people couldn't finance by themselves. As, for example, Hamilton's grandfather, or rather, or rather father-in-law, Philip Schuyler, had, had, had noted. So, so, so this, this, was a, this is a world that they recognized you could, in fact, create if you had a federal government with a strong constitution and which was operating with the principle of the general welfare Notice what's happened to the term welfare. This is over the last 40, right? So when I say, if I say general welfare, you go out on the street and start doing that right now, saying that. People have no idea what you mean and they will believe that they know what you mean. They have no idea what you're saying. The general welfare means that if you take a look at today's United States, and you take a look at today's New York City, by the way, the projection for what the population of New York City would be by the year, I think, between 2010 and 2020 was supposed to be between 12 and 14 million people. That was 1963 projections. So understand that the process, the thing you were in, is a sad version of what it ought to be. See, the important conception, what we're trying to drive at here, and I'll reference this thing with, with, uh, with Moynihan and so on just for a minute here. What time is it, by the way? I want to make sure I don't go over. Yeah, it's uh, 10 to 5. Okay, fine. I just want to give you this reference. It's a book. I, I, I go to this because when we talk about this issue of human life and human worth, this will give you an idea of what the battle was in 1970-71 which had actually been joined, and many people were unaware of. I happened to have had to research this book back at that time uh, when I was working in an unsavory capacity uh, for the Urban Coalition one summer in 1971. It's called The Unheavenly City. It's by Edward Banfield. He is thankfully deceased now. Um, but he was discussing what he called the future of the lower class. And I wanted just give two paragraphs here and you'll see where, why, where this connects, how this comes full circle. The lower class forms of all problems are at bottom, a single problem. The existence of an outlook and style of life which is radically present oriented, not future oriented in other words, and which therefore attaches no value to work, sacrifice, self-improvement, or service to family, friends, or community. Social workers, teachers, and law enforcement officials cannot achieve their goals because they can neither change nor circumvent this cultural obstacle. Despite all that was said to the contrary in the earlier chapters of this book, some readers may suspect that when the author uses the words of lower class, what he has in the back of his mind is Negro. 
Yes, some may suspect that. <laughs> Later on in the book, he's talking about the problem of the family, the lower class family. And he poses the following, and he says why this probably won't work because of cultural limitations. He says, A third implication may seem to be that the child should be taken from its lower class parents at a very early age and brought up by people whose culture is normal. It will do little good to explain to a lower class mother wherein her child rearing practices are wrong. She is not really interested in improving her practices, perhaps because she cannot see anything wrong with them. In this and in other areas as well, her class culture sets sharp limits on what it is possible for her to do. It may seem, therefore, that the only thing to do is to take the child from her and put it in the care of a substitute who will bring it up properly. And then he talks about why the case is not that clear, da da da. And then he says, a little bit later, just a few pages later, as a matter of logic, the simplest way to deal with the problem, and one which would not involve any infringement of parents' rights, would be to permit the sale of infants and children to qualified bidders, both private and public. <laughs> public bidding might be needed to ensure a price high enough to induce a sufficient number of lower class parents to sell their children. This assumes, of course, both that a parent who would sell a child would da 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 okay. Uh, you can see why this was one of the highlights of my early days reading this book. Now, and then he talks about why you can't like practically do that. Now, so human life in the cities of America has been at issue, particularly since the taking of the dollar off the gold standard, August 15, 1971. Lyndon LaRouche, unique to my knowledge, has been the, the person that has stood not only against that, which is not enough, but has demanded that we win and crush these people who believe these things. And he asserts and focuses on the British as did Hamilton focus on the British because that is the name of the enemy. Those are the people. And what keeps happening is people who are either for various reasons, either misguided or cowardly, shift their eyes huh, and shuffle and they start pointing to people that have nothing to do with the problem. The issue is, who has the guts? Does this country have the guts to join Russia, China, India, and others in finishing what we should have finished before, the full-scale takedown of the British Empire and its agents, including its American or quasi-American affiliates? And that is what we are asking you to enlist in with respect to the process that we're going to unleash here next week with our conference on December 13th uh, and, and subsequent conferences that will be happening. Okay? Okay, that's it. Okay, thank you. Good. 100th birthday. And that the city on the Russian side of the tunnel be named after Stanislav Menshikov, to which Menchikov's wife leaped up and responded, and on the American side, there will be a city named after Lyndon LaRouche. Mm -hmm. So, not only does this project, the Bering Strait Tunnel Project, symbolize the necessary strategic friendship between these two great nations, Russia and the United States, but I think it also symbolizes a close personal friendship between two great men the late Stanislav Menshikov and Lyndon LaRouche. In conclusion, I want to just read an excerpt from birthday greetings that Professor Menshikov sent to Lyndon LaRouche for LaRouche's 90th birthday, which occurred in 2012, which were included in a collection of such greetings uh, that came in from all around the world. And I think this is a very proper conclusion for tonight's broadcast. And this is what he had to say. I am happy to be able to congratulate Lyndon LaRouche on his 90th birthday. He is a rare case of human activity, his being so active. Lyndon 
is an example of a creative mind that never stops emanating original ideas. And quite frankly, I am full of envy that at 90 years, he can do all that he is doing. This is, of course, a result of God's goodwill. I cannot put it differently, because usually such brilliant minds are not blessed with the kind of state. The beginning of the class is with this clip, so that the context of the class is appropriately situated, and it's self-explanatory once it's seen. So. <clears throat> idea of the Eurasia land bridge, um, which Menchikov said would be the cornerstone of the new international order. I just want to read a short selection from Menchikov's speech at this birthday celebration. He said, Lyndon LaRouche, who is present here today, has put forward the conception of building the Eurasian land bridge. The Eurasian land bridge is a program of cooperation with the participation of the USA, Western Europe, Russia, with its scientific potential and enormous mineral resources, China, and India. Cooperation for the purpose of building and reorganizing the economic infrastructure over the next 50 years. This will stimulate the progressive growth of the entire world economy. But this plan can only be implemented if there is a cooperation among all of those countries, if their development pr proceeds in a conflict-free way. Lyndon LaRouche believes that one of the areas of such cooperation needs to be a monetary and financial reform, which he calls a new Bretton Woods. This means to establish a fundamentally new monetary system, stamina and health that have helped Lyndon to continue his activity at this age. I believe this shows that God not only gives him this possibility, but that God also approves of the way Lyndon has been acting all these years. Otherwise, it would not happen. So my first thought was that I envy Lyndon in a good way. My health is not as good, and he gives me an example that I try to follow. I hope that he will go on in this way for years to come, contributing to human scientific knowledge. LaRouche is the author of theoretical discoveries in the area I work in, which is the world economy. It doesn't mean that we share the same view of everything, and we have been arguing as many times as, as we have met over the years. But that also does not mean that we are adversaries. For we both know that we are thinking in the same way and in the same direction. I wish Lyndon good health for many years and a happy family life with Helga, his wonderful companion. Mm -hmm. Professor Stanislav Menchikov, August 28, 2012. So with that said, I would like to bring a conclusion to our broadcast here tonight. I would like to thank both Dennis Small and Megan Beats for joining. The uh, conception that we intend in the presentation, uh, which is in part an extension of what we did last week, is one in which uh, what is divested from the mind, like we tried to do last week in part of the beginning of our presentation, we divest Russia, China, and India in order to create a new order of relations in the world, bringing all the smaller nations in to cooperate with them. I think we can do it. We can change history. What I think is urgent at this time is a program for action. First of all, intellectual action. There must be more discussion, particularly between leading layers of senior people in Russia and in the United States. We have to establish a sense of the reality of this possibility. In that case, we can probably win over the political process under the heat of crisis 
to recognize that this is the only alternative to what is presently the most dangerous situation in all modern history. So I think that you can see that what both Professor Menchikoff and Linda LaRouche said at that time, almost eight years ago, is very prescient of precisely where the world finds itself now, uh, as we're working to bring the United States into the BRICS and to stop the immediate threat of World War III. It was also during this same event that Russian academician, uh, who was then the head of the Council for the Study of Productive Forces, Alexander Gronberg, who also passed away recently in 2010, proposed that the Bering Strait Tunnel Connection, which you have a picture of on your screen, um, which is the keystone project of this entire world Eurasian land bridge, which uh, Menchikov was referring to, proposed that this Bering Strait connection be completed by the year 2027, which would have been Professor Menchikov's one, which in some of its features will recall the old Bretton Woods, the system established at the end of the Second World War, which was subsequently destroyed. Such a new world monetary and financial system, once more, will have to be based on cooperation among all the countries I mentioned. Thus, 2027 may be a year by which the planet has been turned upside down in terms of its economy. At the peak, on top, will be countries that were formerly considered the third world, while the traditionally industrialized countries will find that their place in the international division of labor will be determined by certain highly developed, specialized sectors producing goods and services. My last pronouncement will be this, that Russia's path will be a path that upholds these projects for world cooperation. That this, while orienting towards the Eurasian triangle of Russia, China, India, but without forgetting the industrialized countries, Russia should take part in those programs that will lead to conflict-free development that brings about a steady upswing of the world economy. Now, in response to Professor Menchikov's speech, Mr. LaRouche stood up and delivered some remarks at this birthday celebration, um, in which he said the following. He said, the time has come to change some of the axiomatic features of currently ongoing world history. Europe is a collection of failed states west of the Russian and Belarusian border. Therefore, the United States must change its behavior by approaching